All right, guys. It is a hot, sticky, 80-degree day here in the end times in the former paradise of South <coughs> Austin, Texas. <coughs> Somehow, <coughs> I think <coughs> I think I've survived another Christmas weekend. Good Lord, another Christmas come and gone, and now it is. Monday morning here in the end times in the former paradise of South Austin, Texas, December 26, 2016. I'm sitting here dressed like I'm going to the beach on St. Croix, but this is no vacation for your old <clears throat> eco-Nazi because Monday is the day I bring you my economic meltdown roundup rant where I simply go on the finance pages of the mainstream media to bring you more evidence of how this uh, the global industrial economy, the new world order, the planet eaters are bringing down a planet. And guys, you know, once again, you, you cannot make this shit up. How many rants have I had uh, saying if you want to make money in the end times in the stock market that invest your money in the number one poster child for planet eating on the planet. The literal poster child. Literal poster child for planet eating. Which would be Caterpillar Incorporated. You know, the bulldozers. The big yellow bulldozers and all of this literally planet eating. Caterpillar. Who, who is the marketing genius who came up with that name? So, voila. Take a wild guess, anyone who's been listening to my economic meltdown roundup rants should know the number one, the number one stock performer on the entire stock exchange for the year 2016. The number one global planet-eating corporation coming in at 39% up in 2016, Caterpillar Incorporated, the best Dow stock, up 39% in 2016. Let's all hear it for Caterpillar. Caterpillar is the best performing Dow stock of 2016, up, this says 38%. Uh, the Dow, it's overall has risen just over 14 percent over the same period. So uh, anyway, the, these market analysts were kind of scratching their head. You know, you've heard all of this unadulterated horseshit about the global industrial economy has actually slowed down. So why would Caterpillar Incorporated uh, be the number one performer, particularly since, oh, around November 8th, when the stock really shot up. Okay, so what is the riddle of Caterpillar? The riddle of Caterpillar. The answer to the riddle of the increase in its stock price is Donald Trump his broad statements about an infrastructure investment and the weakening of regulations of oil and coal exploration have given Wall Street encouragement that Caterpillar Incorporated will enjoy a windfall of business in a Trump administration. <clears throat> yes, Caterpillar shares have stayed at a high level since Trump's election. Real legislation which supports its sales could take the stock even higher again next year. So uh, you should have listened, I should have listened to myself. If you would listen to me over the past three years, your dollar would have, you would have made 39% in the stock market here in the end times. There is no better story that illustrates, that illustrates the global industrial economy with Donald Trump 
as the new engineer out of this completely out of control freight train uh, than this story. Caterpillar, the number one stock of the year. Okay, as long as we're uh, talking about uh, Trump and oil and all of that, this is from this uh, <clears throat> excellent uh, website, which I'm, which I'm actually uh, subscribed to, and I and, and I highly advise you this oilprice.com to subscribe to them, and this is their latest analysis, the overstated impact of Donald Trump on oil <clears throat> with Donald Trump set to enter the White House and OPEC having agreed to production cuts analysts are focused on how the global oil industry and prices will be impacted in 2017 the new US president-elect and his cabinet along with their pro-drilling pro policies are increasing hopes of a bright future for the U.S. oil industry. But it remains to be seen whether these hopes will, trans will translate into any practical outcome. The most important of Trump's energy appointments is the ex-CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson, as the new Secretary of State. This and the recent deal uh, struck among OPEC and non-OPEC producers has caused global oil markets to rally. Um, and analysts are predicting that Trump's team will approve many of the halted, let's say all, every single one of the halted North American pipeline projects and will make more land available. Can you say our public lands available for drilling, therefore greatly benefiting the U.S. oil and gas industry? But this fellow, uh, Michael Lynch, an energy analyst with a decade of experience in the industry uh, is not so sure and describes how President-elect Donald Trump may in fact cause damage to the industry, to big oil, instead of helping it grow. Uh, I, I love this sentence. With regard to the availability of U.S. federal public lands, one can easily see that more land is not the issue that oil majors and independents face. <laughs> uh, anyway, guys, this is, this is, I'm just trying to capsulate this. I am just a dumb uh, Christmas tree salesman, okay? Uh, you know, I'm just looking at this whole thing. I'm, I'm trying to see how this thing went. As I recall, oil was humming along about $100 a barrel. Barack Obama opened up all of these public lands to fracking and oil drilling and shale drilling and, and, and just being George Bush all over again. And what happened was the price of oil collapsed because of... Uh, uh, of U.S. shale oil, and, and, and I know I'm, okay guys, I'm lumping shale oil and tight oil and fracking all in the same, uh, all in the same boat. You know goddamn well what I'm talking about. And the price of oil collapsed. And of course, the, the shale oil drillers, uh, whose fault it was for the collapse of oil, blamed it on OPEC and, and, and every other country for the collapse in the price of oil. So now, finally, finally, what is it, two years later, uh, OPEC and non-OPEC countries alike, not counting the U.S. and Canada, have announced they're cutting their output to bring the price up. So what is Donald Trump 
and I would say Justin Trudeau, uh, you know, saying it's drill, baby, drill. Uh, I, I just, me and this, this, this crazy oil price analyst are saying, haven't we been through this movie before? Isn't he setting up deja vu all over again? Uh, I don't know. Am I missing something? Am I missing something that this drill baby drill uh, that's getting ready to happen on our federal public lands with all of these goddamn caterpillar bulldozers and drilling equipment raping and pillaging uh, our public lands all over this country, isn't that simply going to repeat the whole thing that threw, the, that threw big oil into the financial mess it's in? Uh, I don't know. Crazy me. Crazy, what was this guy's name? Uh, crazy uh, Michael Lynch for suggesting that Donald Trump's drill baby drill uh, could actually harm big oil. <clears throat> I can't there is this one more story about our friend Donald Trump. Trump adopting same behavior he criticized Clinton for. There you go. Uh, Donald Trump spent the past two years attacking rival Hillary Clinton as crooked, corrupt, and weak. But some of those attacks seem to have already slipped into the history books. Huh. From installing Wall Street executives in his cabinet to avoiding news conferences, the president-elect is adopting some of the very same behaviors for which he criticized Clinton during their fiery presidential campaign. I'm just going to look. This is a long list. Uh, taking a look at the hypocrite-in-chief. Uh, of course, starting out with Goldman Sachs, quoting Donald Trump from the campaign trail. I know the guys at Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, of course he knows them. Uh, he's their best friend. They have total, total control over, he's talking about Ted Cruz, just like they have total control over Hillary Clinton. Well, that was then. This is now. Now, a number of former employees of the Wall Street Bank will play key roles in crafting Trump's economic policy. He's tapped Goldman Sachs President Gary Cohn to lead the White House National Economics Council. Stephen Munchkin, the Treasury Secretary nominee, spent 17 years working at Goldman Sachs. And Steve Bannon, Trump's chief strategist and senior counselor, started his career as an investment banker at the firm. Donald Trump is following in a long political tradition, one he derided on the campaign trail. If Cohn accepts the nomination, which of course he will, he will be the third, the third Goldman executive to run the NEC. And then we go from there to big donors. This is Donald Trump, a quote from Donald Trump uh, in May. <clears throat> Crooked Hillary, look, can you imagine another four years of the Clintons? Seriously, it's time to move on. She's totally controlled by Wall Street and all these people that gave her millions. <clears throat> so, how has this played out? Now, Trump has stocked his cabinet with six of his top donors, far more than any recent White House. <clears throat> Quote, I want people in his cabinet, I want people that made a fortune because now they're negotiating with you, okay? Yes. Who is the single biggest political donor to Donald Trump, that would be incoming small business administrator Linda McMahon, who gave seven and a half million dollars 
to a super political action committee backing Trump. There you go. She's getting rewarded with being the new small business administrator. She bought the small business administration for seven and a half million dollars. As long as we're talking millions of dollars, I got a chuckle out of this one. Halliburton to settle class action suit for $54 million. Petroleum service giant Halliburton said it has reached a $54 million settlement in a class action lawsuit related to asbestos liability disclosures. Uh, the Houston-based company uh, is not admitting guilt to lying out their ass about asbestos disclosures. That uh, gets pretty complicated after that. I, I mentioned <clears throat> these two stories in my Christmas End Times Roundup rant and I just wanted to talk to them uh, a little bit more in today's rant. This one uh, from Forbes magazine, the five most worrying technology trends for 2017 and beyond. I'm going to talk about two of these. Number one being robots and AI will take our jobs. This is not science fiction. According to Forbes magazine, it is happening now. Manufacturing are the first places we see robots and automation eliminating human jobs, but it's hard to think of any industry that will be left unaffected as robots and AI become more affordable and widespread. It is now estimated that between 35 and 50 percent of jobs that exist today on this planet are now at risk of being lost to automation. Repetitive blue collar type jobs might be first, but even professionals, including paralegals, diag diagnosticians and customer service representatives will be at risk. The problem is that the jobs that will remain will require high levels of education and creativity and there will be fewer of them to go around. We need to start thinking about what kinds of jobs the rest of the population will be doing. And then I got a chuckle out of this one, as I mentioned yesterday, the end of capitalism. Uh, one of the risks. Uh, hallelujah, the end of capitalism. While improvements in machine learning, AI, big data, and robot automation could mean huge advances, uh, blah, 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 it's also undeniable that there will be consequences as well, and one of these consequences is that these technological advances represent a significant challenge to capitalism. Together, these, all of this shit, together they are poised to potentially create jobless growth. Jobless growth and the paradox of an exponentially growing number of products manufactured more and more efficiently but with rising unemployment, falling wages, and stagnant living standards. You know, so if we're creating all of this planet-eating crap, yet we're firing everybody. You see the problem? Who the hell is going to be able to afford the planet-eating shit that they are now building if robots are building all of this planet-eating shit and they no longer have a paycheck? Who exactly is going to be buying the planet-eating shit that the robots are building? Hmm. I, uh, I got a big laugh out of, out of this one. 
the very best outcome we could hope for in this situation is a new sort of socialism, a sharing economy in which personal ownership decreases or disappears as we all share the bounty around us equally. But getting to that point may be painful as it requires either the overthrow or the collapse of the current capitalist system. Bring on the robots. And uh, this story that I also mentioned yesterday from International Business Times, will robots steal your job? Probably. Artificial intelligence driven automation will be a crucial driver of economic growth in the U.S. And, and the rest of the planet, but if not handled properly, it can also lead to a massive disruption in the current livelihoods of millions of Americans, not to mention uh, Asians, and could, at least in the short term, increase social inequality. <clears throat> This is the crux of the newest report on the economic impact of AI released Tuesday in the uh, White House. Uh, let's see, estimates of how many jobs, just right here in the U.S., not even counting the rest of the planet, estimates of how many jobs would be lost to AI over the coming decades very widely, largely because the technology is still in its fledgling state and its disruptive effects on the jobs market are still a few years from being widely felt. As a result, predictions range from conservative estimates of about 6% to a staggering 47% percent of U.S. jobs being at risk from the advent of AI and an increase in computerization. And that's according to those old Luddites at the International Business Times. What is Tesla Motors up to? Uh, Tesla Motors Gigafactory, Gigafactory construction is really coming along. <coughs> it is no secret that the lynch, <coughs> that the linchpin in Tesla's ambitious plan to manufacture more than 500,000 cars per year uh, by 2018 is the company's Gigafactory, an absolutely enormous factory that is still under construction in Nevada. Uh, the primary task of the Gigafactory will be to churn out batteries at an impressive clip. Yes, measuring in at five and at one half million square feet, five and a half million square feet, the Gigafactory is an absolutely colossal structure. In fact, the building has the single largest physical footprint of any structure in the world. Naturally, constructing the Gigafactory itself is a huge undertaking that will likely cost Tesla a whopping $5 billion when the dust settles. But don't worry, no problem when they start churning out 500,000 cars a year. Uh, the year after next. Uh, speaking of Nevada, I did get a sick, twisted laugh out of this story. Las Vegas 
is now powered entirely by renewable energy. And uh, they, while they talk mostly about solar in uh, solar uh, energy buried away in this uh, in this article, uh, cheering on uh, Las Vegas going sustainable, uh, Las Vegas will receive power from Hoover Dam for the first time in history starting next year. Hoover Dam. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, guys, I, I cannot even get into a whole thing about uh, Hoover Dam hydroelectric power being, uh, what do they call this, renewable energy, the sick laugh. Uh, w w with all of this going on out there, for the first time, Las Vegas getting a cut from Hoover Dam. But anyway, we're going to wrap up our uh, no global industrial economy uh, rant would be complete without a trip to China. So we're going to wrap up with two stories from China, many versions of this story last week. Smog refugees. There, there's a new term for the end times. Smog refugees struggle to escape air apocalypse. Air apocalypse in Beijing. Yes, winter has arrived in Beijing and residents are struggling to escape the heavy smog that has settled on the city. This season, the air pollution in China, stemming from power plants, factories, vehicles, and other sources, has grown so bad during the past few days that it has put the safety of half a billion people at risk. Since polluted areas of North and Central China were put under red alert uh, by authorities, the haze has thickened, impacting everyday life and causing tens of thousands of smog refugees to evacuate Beijing. These smog refugees, but uh, I, I hope when they get the hell out of Beijing, uh, they're not heading to the countryside in China, where we have this long, uh, detailed article, China's giant cow farms, otherwise known as dairies, China, China's giant cow farms leave neighbors up Milk Creek. Giant piles of black manure towering over cornfields while rancid smelling effluent from thousands of cows spills over the land. This is the price of a glass of milk in China today as large scale dairy farms have boomed and the Asian giant as it's nearly 1.4 billion consumers overcame centuries of cultural reluctance to embrace milk, not uh, to mention, more importantly, uh, the money to buy milk. As an economic boom and govern government backing tra has transformed dairy into a $40 billion a year industry in China, shifting production away from small-scale family farm producers toward massive mega farms with up to 10,000 cattle. Yes, uh, I, I love this. You know, one of these guys, one of the neighbors, they, they interview dodging packets of animal medicine and syringes nearby. This neighbor ex 
explained, the rubbish left after injections is just thrown here on my land. There you go. Uh, anyway, I think you get the picture. Uh, I, I love this. Uh, winding up with the same neighbor pointing to corn stalks growing beside the discarded syringes. This corn farmer said, quote, we don't eat this corn ourselves. We sell it to the market. Oh, Jesus. The market, the global market from mountains of cow shit piling up in China to Caterpillar celebrating being the number one planet-eating corporation on the stock exchange. We are so fucked. We are so fucked. And with that, I will wrap up my very last economic meltdown roundup rant for 2016, looking ahead to, good God, what the hell is coming down the pike. But I got to wrap up this rant because I am looking ahead to what's coming down the pike. And I got to get my ass to the post office to... Uh, to get ready for my new passport to get the fuck out of here. And if I have one piece of advice for anybody who's still sitting here, it is to update your passport and be ready at moment's notice to get the fuck out of Babylon, as my uh, Canadian buddy Vegematic. Get the fuck out of Babylon. <clears throat> but there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Because we are fucked. Bye, guys. Let's see. Has it hit 80 degrees? There you go. There's the weather for December 26th. This is 80 degrees in the shade on uh, December 26th, 2016. Smoke them if you got them. Bye, guys.